Is the conflict with Hamas and Israel and even Hezbollah and Iran prophesied in the scriptures? Does the Bible predict exactly how Israel will defeat each of their enemies in upcoming wars? My guest, Bill Salas, has uncovered future war prophecies that many people have missed in the scriptures. He explains which countries, where the battlefields are, motives, and exact outcomes, including how Israel will defeat each of their enemies. He is the author of Psalm 83, The Missing Prophecy Revealed, How Israel Becomes the Next Mideast Superpower, and many other books on end-time prophecy, and he's a major speaker at prophecy conferences. His new book and DVD are titled, The Future War Prophecies. Bill, when I read your book, and this is, I was absolutely shocked at how many wars and battles are prophesied in the scriptures. And I don't hear anyone else talking about, I mean, I hear people talking about Ezekiel 38. Um, and of course I've heard you talk about Psalm 83 because uh, you've brought that out with uh, other Bible uh, prophecy teachers may be teaching it, but you're the first one I ever heard talk about the details of um, Psalm 83. And, but there's other battles and other uh, wars that are prophesied in the scriptures I have never heard anyone talk about. So I am totally amazed. So now what's going on with Israel? What do you see? Do you see that that's part of uh, a war that is prophesied in the scriptures? Right, as we tape this on day 10 of the conflict in the Middle East, I'm watching very closely to see if this war between Hamas and Israel escalates into a multi-front war, which it seems like it is about to do with Hezbollah to the north, Syria to the northeast, probably even bring in Iran, because these are proxies of Iran. If this escalates, Janie, I think we're going to have prophetic implications. It could lead to a few prophecies that could happen kind of in tandem with each other, like Psalm 83, the final concluding Arab-Israeli conflict. Maybe Isaiah 17 talks about the destruction of Damascus one night. One, one day, Damascus will cease from being a city, the oldest continuously inhabited city in recorded history will one day, according to Isaiah 17, cease from being a city. It will be a ruinous heap. And then I also have a prophecy that I'm watching closely dealing with Iran. And Iran is involved in two prophecies in the end times. One is Ezekiel 38 under the banner of Persia. But before Ezekiel wrote, around 596 BC, Zechariah, I mean, uh, Jeremiah wrote another prophecy about Elam. And that was uh, Iran, that was dealing with the prophecy in Elam in Jeremiah chapter 49, verses 34. Through 39. So Ezekiel wrote about 20 years later about Persia, but they're not the same prophecies. So Iran has double trouble in the end times. They have the subject of dual prophecies. So we've got a lot of things that could come into play in, in the midst of this conflict right now if it escalates. Yeah. Now, what I find interesting is that you saw pro um, wars that would happen even before the Psalm 83 or even before Damascus would be destroyed and concerning Iran. And it's interesting to me how much uh, Iran is funding, you know, sending weapons to Syria, uh, sending weapons uh, to uh, funding Hamas, funding Hezbollah. So they're really behind so much. And here Biden gave six million, uh, six billion uh, to Iran, which I thought I found out it was really equivalent to like 60 billion because um, of the sanctions and letting Iran just do their thing. So it's almost like it's almost like we are funding th these wars. Well, you know, of course, the Biden administration, when they released that six billion dollars, which is to be funneled through Qatar, uh, they did not expect this to blow up in the Middle East like it did on the level that it did. And since that time, they've sort of been talking about freezing those, the release of those $6 billion. So we'll have to see how that plays out. But they certainly the Biden administration got called to the carpet on that by the Republicans, and rightfully so, because even though they said it was supposed to be for humanitarian purposes, Iran would still use it in whatever way they want. They'd grab money from some other coffer, knowing that that other $6 billion is coming in. So... You know, Iran is the state sponsor of terrorism over there with Hezbollah to the north. It has about 150,000 missiles pointed directly at Israel. Some of them are preci precision guided. They have a bank of targets that they can hit anywhere in Israel within pinpoint accuracy. If they come into the fray, estimates are there's an article that came out. I'll, I'll bring to your attention that says this. It says, this just came out recently in the 
Israel national news dealing with Hezbollah. Let's just talk about them for a moment because there is skirmishes going on right now between Israel and Hezbollah to the north. And in fact, Israel opened an underground hospital that could seat, you know, house thousands of people that are injured or wounded. And it's like a triple story underground parking lot. Uh, they have thousands of troops amassed at the northern border where Hezbollah is at. And they're very concerned that Hezbollah is going to get involved in this war. And if they do, there's a predict predicted scenario I want to read to you in the Israel National News that says 6,000 rockets at Israel could be fired during the first few days of war with Lebanon, with Hezbollah. Now, we know that the Hamas, they say they allowed 5,000 missiles in their initial conflict, which was shocking, but it probably was a little less than that. But even still, it was a lot more than we thought they had. They created all kinds of havoc, but 6,000 missiles coming in, precision guided, can hit pinpoint targets in Tel Aviv, hit the Demona Airport uh, nuclear reactor, they can hit the Ben Gurion Airport. And of course, we know a lot of people are evacuating, Americans and, and the United Kingdom and other tourists are trying to leave Israel as we speak on day 10 of this war. 6,000 missiles could be launched in there. It says Israel's defense establishment is preparing for the worst case scenario during a war on the northern border, which would include days-long blackouts, hundreds dead, and thousands wounded. And the article says within the first few days, about 6,000 rockets would be launched at the Jewish state. The first layer of attack, first few days, 6,000 pin precision-guided type missiles. That number would de decline to about 1,500 to 2,000 rockets in the second phase of the Hezbollah conflict. Again, we're only talking about Hezbollah, not Syria, not any Hamas. And their effective missiles, they're talking about 2,000 effective missiles, meaning not taken out by Iron Dome, not landing indiscriminately in the fields. This would create a massive amount of damage and casualties inside of Israel. Now, Israel is preparing for this conflict. They've been preparing for it. We're seeing the, their preparations going into action right now as we air this, this program. They In May of 2022, they had a massive drill called Chariots of Fire where they prepared for a war to attack Iran's nuclear programs and in retaliation, prepare for a proxy war with Hamas, Hezbollah, Syria, the Houthis, Shiite militias in Iraq, the Islamic Jihad in the West Bank. Uh, and, and, we're, and they are also preparing for casualties inside of Israel, which is that's why they opened that underground hospital that I just mentioned. So we're seeing what, what you're seeing right now as they deploy troops to the Gaza, trying to go into an incursion inside of Gaza, as they deploy troops to the northern border. These, this has all been part of their plan. They've been planning this for quite some time, but they they were caught off guard, I think, when Hamas came at them with troops broke, that broke through the fence, started killing all those people and those babies. And now, they've, now they're putting into effect all the plans they've been making for quite some time now. Okay, so then what would happen next? Because um, I know that you've written about uh, a conflict with Iran, with Israel. I mean, could, I mean, Iran would like to obliterate Israel off the map. So do you think, so would this be described in that prophecy um, where, I mean, do you think then Israel would try to get rid of all of the, the weapons that are in Iran that are, uh, that, that are, to that are, uh, you know, aimed towards them? I mean, how is this prophesied like if it ends up being a, a conflict directly with Iran? Or, right, because, or their proxies? Right, because the focus now is on Hamas, but that's not the big problem. That's that's sort of the, the bumblebee getting a sting, whereas Iran is sort of the lion that could attack you ferociously with their proxies. Uh, Israel still has to be concerned about Iran's nuclear program because Recent headlines said they were just two weeks away from having sufficient fissile materials, this is about a week ago, to put together a nuclear weapon if they don't already have one. And they have recently displayed that they have a hypersonic ballistic missile that can go travel to Israel in 400 seconds, which is 6.66 .66 minutes, five times the speed of sound, and can carry a nuclear warhead and can hit anywhere in Israel. Plus, they have ballistic missiles that can get there in, in, they say, eight minutes. And they've had those for a while. So that's the big issue. The prophecy, I'm going to t kind of sequence what I think could happen. Um, I think that, and it may not be in this exact order, but the prophecy in Jeremiah chapter 49, verses 34 through 39, dealing with Elam, E-L-A-M, this is a territory that hugs the Persian Gulf. It is on the western side of Iran. Persia is sort of in the central and the main part of Iran. 
But when you see on the map, the modern day map of Iran, you have Elam, which is about a third of the map of Iran, and Persia, which is about two thirds. And Elam is where they've got the underground missile silos, portable rocket launchers, their underground air base. Uh, this is where they've hidden all their missile defense systems. Israel's got to get through this territory so they can get into the nuclear facilities of main concern inside of Iran proper, which would be Parchin, Natanz, and Fordo nuclear power plants. They've got to take those out. That's where they're producing and enri enriching uranium for a nuclear weapon. There is also a nuclear facility inside of Elam at the Bushar nuclear reactor. Russia has $10 million worth of contracts to build two more nuclear reactors there, Bashar 1, Bashar 2, and Bashar 3. So there is, could actually be a nuclear disaster that could happen right there. But Israel's got to go through this territory in order to get to those nuclear power plants. And they've been planning to do that. Of course, now they're caught up in this major uh, war with Hamas that will probably lead to a war with Hezbollah and Syria as well. But the thing is, they've got to get through that Elam territory. And the prophecy, Janie, talks about... Uh, the Lord is going to be fiercely angry with the leaders of Iran, and, and he's going to bring about a disaster in that specific territory. And we find out the reason he's angry with them is they've got bad leaders because he says he will destroy from them the kings and the princes. I think that anger is in existence right now. The Lord is fiercely angry with Iran. They want to wipe Israel off of the map. It says that the reason he's angry is they want to launch something lethal somewhere because they want to. he's going to break the bow of Elam at the foremost of their might. That's a detail of the prophecy. That would be he's going to get somehow dismantle their uh, missile launching capabilities. And so that's that's that area where all those missiles are, that, that Elam territory. And it goes on to say that when that happens, a disaster will be created, and it will create a humanitarian crisis because it says the indigenous population will scatter to all the nations of the world. It says there will be no nations, plural, where the outcasts of Elam don't go. It'll happen in a time when Elam has a, a menu of enemies, which they have right now. It says that this prophecy that will be pursued by the sword, which is a typology for a military confrontation. So this prophecy, I believe, is about to happen. Whether it happens before the destruction of Damascus or after, that I don't know. But I, if you want me to keep going on, I got the whole scenario laid out for your, your viewers if you want me to keep going. Yeah, I do. Absolutely. And the thing that also in your book that proved, you know, some people will say, oh, some of these prophecies have been fulfilled. No, they haven't. And you really explained it really well that, nope, these things have not happened before. But yes, please go on. Okay. And I'm glad you brought that out because we like to make sure that people understand uh, why they have not been historically fulfilled. In the case of Psalm 83, why it's more than just a prayer, but it's a future war prophecy. So we went to great lengths inside of the book and the companion DVD to show the reasons why these are future war prophecies that are stage setting at the present time and very well could happen as a result of things escalating in this war with Hamas as we speak. But I think ultimately at some point, uh, the, Iran's going to call on its proxies. I have a chapter called The Proxy Wars That Shakes Israel, and I think it, it is in part of Isaiah 17. And what happens in Isaiah 17 is that uh, Israel gets himself involved in a war with Syria, and they have no uh, remedy apart from, because they've got Hezbollah probably getting involved, Hamas is already involved, Syria's got chemical weapons, they used them 300 times in their Syrian revolution. Uh, Iran is trying to get those chemical weapons into Hezbollah's hands. And I think they're going to find themselves in a prison rules fight, and they will have to take out a city. And they have the ability to take out a city with a nuclear weapon launched at the right altitude uh, overnight. And that's what the prophecy says. It says, Isaiah 17, 1 says, Behold the burden against Damascus. It will cease from being a city. It will be reduced to rubble. It will be a ruinous heap. We're told in Isaiah 17, verse 9, that the desolation in other cities, not just Damascus, will be caused by the children of Israel, the Israeli Defense Forces. Some people think it's Assyria that happened in 732 BC, but it tells us no, it's the Israeli Defense Forces. Again, I explain that in an addendum why it did not happen in 732 BC in my book. And then it goes on in Isaiah 17, verses 14, and says that one night you see Damascus, it's, you see him, Damascus in the masculine pronoun, but in the morning he is no more. So one night you see Damascus, and in the next morning you don't see it. It's gone, it's reduced to rubble. And it says this is a portion of those who rob us and those who plunder us. So it pictures Israel in self-defense having to take out a major city. Now that's going to lead to, I believe, the Psalm 83 war. But 
Uh, any thoughts or comments on that before I go into that one? Um, so with the Psalm 83 war, so right, again, you see two wars um, that are, could happen before the Psalm 83 war, and the Psalm 83 war is involving 10 different nations, correct? Correct. Ten, the countries and terrorist populations within those countries that share common borders with Israel, you've got Lebanon to the north where you have Hezbollah, you have Syria, and you have Iraq. Of course, Syria's got the chemical weapons, Iran's proxies. Uh, there's Shiite militias that Iran supports inside of Iraq. You have Jordan. Jordan has a fragile peace treaty with Israel, but I can tell you why that's going to be shattered shortly. You have uh, Saudi Arabia. You have the Palestinians. You have the Hamas and ancient Philistia. Uh, it actually talks about in the prophecy the tents of Edom, Psalm 83, verse 6, lists the Palestinian refugees. Tents of in the Bible would, would reference refugee conditions. Edomites have ethnical representation in the Palestinians today. It also talks, I believe, about Egypt as well. Egypt has a fragile peace treaty with Israel that will also be shattered as per Isaiah 19. So, I mean, I get into all of these prophecies in the book, but you know, it's interesting when we talk about Psalm 83, and I want to tell you how I think we get there from the wars we're talking about. Jane, I don't know if you recall, but when we did, I did a show with Sid Roth, and you were there, and you yep, helped me. I had come produced, up. yep, I had produced that show. Now you helped me come up with a name. We were trying to figure out a name for my Psalm 83 book. It just had come out, I think it was back in 2012 or 13. And you helped me come up with the name Psalm 83, The Missing Prophecy Revealed, <laughs> How Israel Becomes the Next Midi Superpower. What a great name. Yeah, um, I can't believe you remember that, but it's just, it, to me, it was missing because people didn't know about it. Well, in light of what's going on right now, that book has been selling off the shelf. I mean, we can hardly keep keep it in stock right now, along with the future war prophecies you're talking about. That book is also selling very rapidly right now because it's very relevant to what's going on. Very. So how we get to Psalm 83, um, I believe what happens when Damascus gets destroyed. Now remember, Syria recently rejoined the Arab League, the 22 members of the Arab League. They were they got out of it about 10 years ago because of their Syrian revolution. They kicked Syria out, but they're back in now. And the Arab countries have an alliance with them again. And I think when Damascus gets destroyed, the capital of Syria, uh, the other countries and they'd be concerned about like in Lebanon, Beirut, what's going to happen to Beirut? What is going to happen to Amman, Jordan, and Jordan, the capital of Jordan? What's going to happen to Mecca and Saudi Arabia? What's going to happen to Cairo and Egypt? We also find out in Isaiah 17, verses 4 through 6, that in this war with Syria and the, the proxies of Iran, that Israel takes a severe hit. We're told in Isaiah 17, verse 4, that the glory of Jacob, that would be Israel, shall fade. The fatness of his flesh will grow lean. Uh, it'll be like a shaking of an olive tree with two or three branches left, uh, olives left in the uppermost branches, and four or five in the fruitful boughs. And I take, and when I teach, and it's on the DVD, I take an olive tree, which is Israel's national tree, and a fruited variety of that tree can have up to 500,000 olives on it. And it's going to be shaken in this proxy war, and only two or three olives left in the uppermost branch, and three or four in the fruitful boughs. And I superimpose an olive tree over a map of Israel. And the uppermost branch would be in the Haifa area, the, the, the fruitful bough would be around the Tel Aviv area. And I'm very concerned that those areas are going to be struck in this proxy war, which causes Israel to have to take out this Arab city of Damascus. Now, recently, the president of Iran, President Raisi, said if you attack Iran, we will take out Hel Tel Aviv and Haifa. So they're already threatening the very thing we're talking about that Isaiah seems to have prophesied about. And I think when that city goes down to rubble, Damascus, and other major cities, we find out in Jeremiah chapter 49, verses 23 through 27, that Aleppo, by the ancient name of Arpad, and Homs and Hama, the two, two and three big cities inside of Syria, just below Aleppo to the north, uh, that would be Hamath in ancient times. That is also taken out along with Damascus, according to Jeremiah chapter 49, verses 23 through 27. So it's going to be a major war with the Syria. There's going to be desolation caused by the children of Israel. And when the, and the world sees Damascus go up in smoke overnight, be reduced to rubble, the Arab states are going to be in an uproar. And then we concerned about their cities we just talked about, their capital cities. And by the way, Israel will now be hurt. They will be shaken by this war that's happened. So they'll be weakened. <clears throat> yeah, so they will feel that they can go forward now and, and have a final attempt, like they tried to do in 1948. The very countries in 1948 that came to that war against Israel are the same countries and populations that will come against Israel 
in the final concluding war of Psalm 83. Ah, and interesting. When they see that, Israel's hurt, and they're worried about the, the safety of their own cities, um, they, I believe they would come together in that final attempt of Psalm 83, and that would be the conclusion, because Israel will win that war. Um, yeah, now I find it very interesting because I know that you said that there's some Bible um, prophecy teachers saying, oh, Psalm 83 war already came to pass, but I thought you brilliantly laid it out in the book how, nope, it, 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 it's, it, hasn't, it hasn't been fulfilled yet. Yeah, you know, it's, some people believe it's just a prayer, um, and they, they search out commentaries and say that's what it was always taught to be. I'm going to read you a commentary that from 1877, just a comment. John Peter Lang, who was a well-respected theologian, and his, he has the author of the Lang Commentary on the Holy Scriptures, he says, with regard to the time of composition, the following difficulty meets us. Ten nations are, who are here enumerated as being combined against Israel are never mentioned elsewhere as enemies allied at the same time and for the purpose of annihilating Israel. So he's making a note that they've never, it's not a chronological order of ordering of Israel's enemies, it's a contemporary confederacy that has never been listed together, enumerated together before. He goes on to say, and yet the expressions are of such a nature that we cannot be inclined to consider this enumeration as only a poetical individualizing of the general idea. Enemies from all sides, the position of Assyria as an auxiliary of the sons of Lot, that is, the Moabites and Ammonites, is especially unfavorable to this view. Now, let me, I was talking fast. Let me explain that. What he's saying that inside of the Confederacy, you have Assyria, it says, is helping the children of Lot. They're actually helping another member in the Confederacy, meaning it's a legitimate Confederacy. The children of Lot would be Jordan, Ammon, and Moab. You also have uh, populations listed in habitation conditions, meaning when this happens, there'll be the tents of Edom, there'll be Palestinian refugees. It talks about the inhabitants of Tyre in Lebanon, Tyre. Uh, I believe that could be referencing the Hezbollah, which is a state within a state. So you have you have Confederates listed in habitation conditions. You have Confederates con helping one another. And some some people say in 1948, this war found happened and was finally concluded. And then I would say a couple things on that. One is if this happened in 1948, how come nobody mentioned that until I started bringing it to, to the forum in 2008 with my first book in 2013 with the book you and I talked about, Psalm 83? Everyone was talking about Israel being a fulfillment of prophecy. But at that time, supposedly Psalm 83 got filled. No one was talking about that until all of a sudden I started bringing it up to the forefront. Um, the other thing, too, it talks about Asaph tells God, petitions God in Psalm 83, verses 9 through 11, that he would like, how he would like God to deal with this oppression of these countries. And it draws our attention back to the book of Judges, chapters 4 through 8. When the uh, Judges 4 and 5, we had Deborah the prophetess. The Canaanites had oppressed Israel for 20 years. Deborah the prophetess was told that that oppression is going to stop. So she got a general Barak. They went against the Canaanites. They killed the King Jabin. They killed the general Sisera, the leaders and the infantry. And the Canaanites never oppressed Israel again. Then we go to fast forward to Judges chapter 6 through 8. We had Gideon and his 300-man army they went to battle against the Midianites. And Asaph says, deal with them like the Midianites. And he starts talking about deal with them like Orban Zeb, Zeban Zamuna. Those Orban Zeb were the princes of the Midianites, and and Zeban Zamuna were the kings. So what he's saying there is deal with them like Gideon did with those guys. The Midianites had oppressed Israel for seven years. Gideon and the three hundred man army destroyed them. They killed one hundred twenty thousand Midianites. Gideon killed Zeban Zamuna, the kings. Orban Zeb was killed by Gideon's men. And from entry, infantry out to the leadership, they were all destroyed, and the Midianites never again oppressed the Jewish people. Now, we didn't see that in 1948. We saw them come right back again in 1967 and in 1973. So that oppression is not stopped, and that's what Asaph was saying. Get, deal with them so that the oppression would stop once and for all. And there's many other reasons that why I think it's uh, still a prophecy, not just a prayer, and it was not historically fulfilled. Okay, now I also fi find it interesting when you, you're talking about these different battles and you talk about how Israel um, wins against these enemies and even details of how they do it. But with, these, with the Psalm 83 war, what, what's going to happen with Israel? Because it's, it's uh, yeah, lay out what's, what happened with Israel after that war. Okay, I will, because I think 
after they've dealt with the Iran prophecy in Elam, the destruction of Damascus in Isaiah 17, and the Psalm 83 war, we're going to be seeing Ezekiel 38, the Gog and Magog invasion, coming around the corner. And the stage will be set for that. But before I do that, um, there's a lot of peripheral prophecies that are related to Psalm 83, another argument as to why Psalm 83 has not found fulfillment. Uh, some people would say, well, there's a, treat, a peace treaty with Jordan and with Egypt, between Israel and Egypt and Israel and Jordan. I told you that Iman Jordan would be concerned that they could be the next casualty after Damascus. Well, guess what they are? And I'll tell you why. And there's no peace treaty in the prophecies I'm about to tell you. We're told in uh, Jeremiah chapter 49, verse 2, that there's an alarm of war in Rabbah of the Ammonites. That would be Amon Jordan. It says it shall be a desolate mound and Israel shall take possession of its inheritance, thus says the Lord. So Israel goes to war. Jordan gets involved in the Psalm 83 conflict, the Confederacy. It says Assyria helps Jordan, the children of Lot. They get involved in the final conflict. They Their city also gets destroyed. It becomes a desolate mound, much like what happens to Damascus. Another camera angle of that is in Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 8, where it says, I've heard the reproach of Ammon and Moab against the borders of my people Israel. And it goes on to say that for them doing that, and that would be Moab and Ammon would be Ammon would be northern Jordan. We just talked about them, and the Ammonites. Uh, Moab would be central Jordan. And it goes on and says, because you, I've heard the reproach, you're going to come against the borders of Israel. Uh, the residue of my people will plunder you, and the remnant of my people will possess you. So the Israeli defense forces will plunder them, and the remnant of Is the Israelis will actually possess Jordan, which is part of the process when Israel wins wars, they annex territory. And they do that for about three or four reasons. One is when you win a war, you can take over territory. Two, it increases the defensibility of their borders. And three, that's the land that was given to the patriarch Abraham in Genesis 15, 18, from the river of Nile, the river of Egypt, probably the Nile, to the river Euphrates, which courses through modern-day Syria and Iraq. And we found that Joshua did this about 3,300 years ago when he conquered in the land of Canaan. King David and King Solomon did about 3,000 years ago. And Israel did it back in 1967 in that Six-Day War. So I think that's what we're watching for. And I can tell you shortly how that would set the stage for Ezekiel 38. Okay, right. So what you're saying is that Israel will expand their borders. And a lot of people don't realize that even, um, you know, land was promised to them more land than they have even right now. Uh, but even originally, like you said, you know, biblically, they had way more land originally. Well, at, at Joshua's time, he had quite a bit of land. King David even took more land than Israel has today. Um, you could actually, in the promised land, which goes from the river of Egypt to the Euphrates, you could actually fit about 36 Israels into that. And, and they will get all that land when Jesus Christ returns at the second coming and sets up his millennium. But they're going to get some of it incrementally before that time. Not not a lot, but some. They'll get Jordan. They'll get certain parts of southern Lebanon. They'll get the West Bank. They'll get the Gaza. Uh, they'll get a little bit of northern Egypt uh, as a result of this war, and they will move into those territories. And I point this all out in, in my book. But uh, this this is where I think this is going. And when they win this war, they can then dwell securely. And Ezekiel 38 tells us two times for your viewers that are familiar with Ezekiel 38, it's a massive confrontation, it includes probably led by Russia, would include Turkey, Iran. There's nine members in this coalition. It's different coalition than in Psalm 83, and I'll, I'll explain those differences shortly. But Russia is going to come into Israel for plunder and booty at a time when Israel dwells securely, without walls, bars, nor gates, in the midst of the land. Uh, coming out of persecution, which we know they've done that, and they'll be a peaceful people, and Russia will be coming for plunder and booty, so Israel has to be extremely prosperous. Now, that Israel does not exist just yet, not in all those capacities. They do not dwell securely without walls, bars, nor gates. Um, the, world, the word securely is, dwell securely is Yeshua Batak, and it means the security you get going securely because you don't have any enemies around you to, to fight anymore because you defeated them and now you can dwell securely and you can tear down walls. Now Israel has a 403 mile wall The courses through Israel proper called the partition wall at some feet points is 20 feet tall with 
filled with concrete. Of course, there was a wall and fences built around the Hamas, but they busted through that and invaded and attacked Israel. There's walls, two walls to the north that separates Hezbollah and Lebanon from Israel. There's a wall down by the Sinai, and there's also a wall they're building and have built between Jordan and Israel, trying to keep weapons smuggling out from the Palestinians in Jordan into Israel. So it turns out that Israel is the most fenced in and fortified country in the world. So they're not dealing with walls, bars, nor gates, but after they defeat their enemies around them, we're told in Isaiah 28, verses 24 through 26, that's exactly what happens. They will dwell securely when those around them who despise them have judgments executed upon them, then Israel can dwell securely. The ones around them who despise them form an inner circle of countries to share common borders with Israel. We talked about who they were in Psalm 83, Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, Iraq, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, the terrorist groups inside Hamas, Palestinians, Hezbollah. They've been Israel's enemies from time immemorial. Uh, they came against Israel in 1948. They will come against Israel again in a final attempt. I believe that would be Psalm 83. I believe that's stage setting presently. Um, and that's when, after they defeat them, they can tear down the walls because they won't need them anymore. And they, more Aliyah would happen, more Jews would come back into the land as the territory starts to expand. And it's safer for Jews to come back into Israel. And then that Israel becomes the Israel that Russia comes after, in my estimation. Um, you know, what I find really interesting, and again, this is uh, when people try to object to saying, oh, all these prophecies have come to pass before. It was really interesting when I read about what you said about World War I and World War II, how it set the stage for certain countries to be reinstated. Or um, if could you just explain that briefly? Yes, World War I uh, actually prepared the land for the Jewish people. World War II prepared the Jewish people for the land, to return to the land. And let me explain how that works. Um, God has a peace plan in place that no one's aware of, the politicians aren't aware of it. And it's a, it's a wonderful peace plan. It's already been, he's been implementing it since World War I. And it's in Jeremiah chapter 12, verses 14 through 17. And I'll try to quote it by memory. And I'll tell you how it plays out in the World War One and World War Two. Uh, it says in Jeremiah chapter twelve, verses fourteen and fifteen. Thus says the Lord God, against all my evil neighbors. He's calling those people around about Israel evil neighbors, because indeed, as we know, they are. They're evil toward Israel, and they have a hatred of Israel that stems way back when. He says, "I will pluck you out of their land, because Israel is going to become a nation, which it did in 1948, and I will pluck them, the Jewish people, out of your Arab lands." And I'll bring them back into their land, and I'll have compassion on everybody, bring everybody back to their own inheritance. So we'll stop right there for a minute. That's Jeremiah 12, verses 14 through 15. We find that World War I, after the Ottoman Empire was defeated, they had ruled over the Middle East from about 1517 to 1917 for 400 years. And they got defeated. And all of a sudden now the Balfour Declaration comes out in 1917, and they want to give Israel a homeland again in what would have been called Transjordan, which is today includes Jordan, modern day Jordan and Israel. Of course, the Arab agonized over that. The Arabs agonized over that because they helped defeat the Ottoman Empire and they did not want Britain to uh, implement the Balfour Declaration. Of course, that subjected the Jewish people to the Holocaust and six million Jews, of course, were subsequently killed in World War II. But going back to what happened after 1917, the Lord said he was going to bring those, pluck those evil neighbors out and bring them back into their, their old ancient homeland. So he starts making that happen sovereignly. This is not the United Nations doing this. This is the Lord doing this. Egypt becomes a nation in 1922. Uh, Syria and Iraq, I think it was 1932. No, no, it was uh, Saudi Arabia and Iraq, 1932. Persia became Iran in 1935. Uh, Jordan and Syria became nations, I think, in 1946. Lebanon, I think it was 1943. So we see that the Lord is reestablishing the Arab states and the, putting those, plucking those evil neighbors out and putting them back into their lands. And then, of course, here comes Israel in 1948, and it becomes Israel, not Palestine anymore. And the Arabs didn't want that. The evil neighbors started coming against Israel. So the Lord says in Jeremiah chapter 12, verses 16 and 17, I have a compassion on all you once I bring you back in your lands. All I ask that you do for this great work he's doing is swear by me, like you taught my children of Israel to swear by Baal. Now, when Jeremiah wrote this, the Jewish people were sacrificing their children to Baal. I mean, they were zealous for, for the false god Baal. Now, God's not saying, you know, I want 
the Arabs to sacrifice their children to me, but he's saying, I want you to you worship me with the same zeal that you forced my Jewish people to worship Baal back at Jeremiah's time. And he says, if you don't do that, I will utterly pluck up and destroy that nation. All those nations that the Lord established after World War I, he's going to utterly pluck them up. And we see that in Psalm 83. That's not part of Ezekiel 38. Okay, now, do you, um, if, if someone said to you, do you think, now you named all these other battles, but do you think then Ezekiel 38 could happen really soon after these other battles? I mean, can it happen in the next few years? I mean, what do you think? I think so. I don't think there'll be a lot of time. You know, as we sit here and do this program, Israel celebrated on May 14th its 75-year anniversary of being a nation. I don't think the next prophecy when it finds fulfillment, which we could be seeing stage setting right now, is going to take 75 more years to, for the one to follow that and the one to follow that. I think they're going to happen soon and sequentially and build up to the big prophecy, the marquee event of Ezekiel 38, because that's the prophecy that God is going to stop supernaturally through an earthquake, Every man's sword will be against his brother. There'll be fire, brimstone, flooding rains. God, it'll be too formidable of a fence for Israel to stop. The American forces are not involved. God goes into his arsenal and brings out his biggest weapons supernaturally and defeats the invaders. And when he does that, the world's going to take note. They're going to go, wow, that was not normal victory. And he says in Ezekiel 39, 7, after he's done that, I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel. They shall not profane my holy name anymore, and the nation shall know I'm the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. It requires her to be in uh, my people Israel. Hitler could not be successful. The Arabs could not be successful in destroying the Jews. Uh, it had to be a land of Israel. The Arabs can't take over the land of Israel because of the Holy One in Israel. And those things are going to be in place. Now, Iran wants to wipe Israel off the map. So did the Psalm 83 countries. That will not happen because God is going to make his holy name known in the midst of his people Israel as the Holy One in Israel. And that is coming soon because he wants to put the world on notice that he's the covenant-keeping God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the promise-keeping God of believers. And there's several reasons why I believe that's a pre-tribulation event. Well, that's one of them, because he's going to let the world know before the Antichrist comes on the scene and deceives people into worshiping him that there's another alternative. And that's the God of the Bible who keeps his covenants and promises. So do you see then, um, then where does Armageddon fit in? Well, I believe Ezekiel 38 happens before the tribulation, three and a half years before, because they're converting weapons for seven years into fuel. Uh, they could do that in the first three and a half years before the tribulation, the first three and a half years in the tribulation. But at the midpoint of the tribulation, they're going to be fleeing from their lives because the Antichrist is going to try to commit a final campaign of genocide against the Jewish people. And he's going to be highly successful, not entirely because we're told in Zechariah 13, 8, that two-thirds of the Jews in the land will be cut off, but one-third will come through. We call them the faithful Jewish remnant. Now, they will flee. Jesus tells them to flee in Matthew 24, verses 15, at the mid part of the tribulation, when the Antichrist goes into the temple, it will exist at that time, and the Jews are wanting to build that now. Uh, he will set up as the abomination of desolation, which some of us believe is his image of the beast. When Jesus says, when you see that, Matthew 24, 15, he says, flee to the mountains. And he's referring to the mountains in southern Jordan, which Israel will have possession over that at that time after Psalm 83. And, we, and I pinpoint the location of where they're going in the future war prophecies book as Petra, at the southern end of the mountain range of southern Jordan. They will go there. They'll flee there. And when the Antichrist assembles his troops in at Armageddon, which is, would be the Jezreel Valley, uh, he's going to then come down and try to go through Jordan, down to what's called Basra. We find that there's a slaughter in Basra in Isaiah 34, I believe it is. Basra is at the northern end of the mountains where the Jews will be in the southern end of the mountains in Petra. And when the Jews see he's coming down after them, he's already successfully killed two-thirds of the Jews. He's coming after them, the final third. They're going to realize that the only hope they have now is in Jesus Christ to return for them. And they will say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that's a mandate as for Matthew 23. Jesus said to them, I will not return again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they will say that. They will recognize he is the Messiah, and he will come for them. And he will single-handedly, in Isaiah 63, destroy those troops that have assembled at Basra, and there will be a slaughter in Basra. That's okay. called the Armageddon campaign. I see. And so wait, is Armageddon then at the very, very end? It's at the very end of the second coming, but it's a campaign with 11 phases I get into, mm -hmm. starting with the mid part of the tribulation when the Antichrist comes into Jerusalem, and then he goes down into Egypt. He's winning wars. He's destroying Jewish people. And then more things start to happen. Ultimately, the Jews flee. 
to, to Petra. So there's 11 stages to the campaign of Armageddon, but it concludes at the second coming at the end of the tribulation. And it seems also then that prophecy that says they will look on him whom they have, whom ha they have pierced, um, then is coming to pass during that time too, correct? Yes, I believe that's Zechariah 12 at the tail end of the chapter. That will actually happen, I believe, in the first part of the, after Jesus comes at the second coming, he restores the remnant back into their old homeland of Israel, taking them out of Petra. They return. In the process, the Old Testament saints get resurrected, Abraham, David, Joseph, all, Jeremiah, all those guys. Uh, they all meet up together with the remnant. Even the tribulation saints get resurrected. And this is, happens in the first, it's called the 75-day interval before we get into the thousand-year messianic kingdom. So after the second coming, the Antichrist gets defeated. He and the false prophet get cast into the lake of fire. Jesus comes back with the remnant. They run into their, all their forefathers and patriarchs. They all go into the territories they're supposed to go into. They find out what tribes they're descendants of. They go with their tribal leaders into those places. And as all of them, even the tribes, the house of David, the house of Nathan, we're told in Zechariah 12, they will all mourn those whom they pierce as like a firstborn son. I believe that mourning period will last for 30 days because we have a precedent of that with Moses when he was, they grieved him for 30 days. And then Aaron, his brother, they grieved him for 30 days. I put uh, those, I have a Millennium Prophecies book where I get into all that. But 75 days, Jesus is going to mop up the mess. He's going to restore the earth. The Old Testament saints will be resurrected. They're going to come back. The Jews are going to come back in the promised land. And they're going to mourn him whom they pierced as the firstborn son. Uh, it's the details that you have uncovered, you know, in scripture, it's just amazing research. And then you also talk about that I hadn't heard anyone, you know, um, battles that are really directly with demons. And even that the 200 million, you know, a lot of people, and I used to, I mean, I thought it was China the 200 million army, but you say that it's a demonic army. Can you explain that? Yeah, we're talking about the trumpet wars that happened just before the mid part of the tribulation, the fifth and sixth trumpet. I do get into these in the Future War Prophecies book and DVD. Uh, the fifth trumpet judgment, I'll explain real quickly. Uh, there is a Apollyon, who means destroyer, I believe it's a fallen angel, will open up the Euphrates. And that will come smoke and dust. With, the, with he said, uh, John the Revelator says would be looking like locusts, but they sting like scorpions. And they've got weird looking de details. It talks about them not really being literal locusts. They're told not to harm the, the green grass of the trees, which is what locusts live on. And they're going to torment men who don't have the seal of God for five months. They're going to torment them so bad that they wish they could die, but they can't. And that's going to be a major five month campaign. Those who have the seal of God, I believe, would be not only the 144,000 who get the seal of God in Revelation chapter 7, but I believe it's also people who are saved who become believers. I believe they also get the seal of God, much like we do get sealed when we get saved in the church age. Uh, they're going to torment them for five months. And then after that, we have the sixth trumpet judgment. We have 200 million come out of the Euphrates. Uh, four, four angels open up the Euphrates. And 200 million, they, I believe their demons come out, and they come to kill a third of mankind, which would be maybe about 2 billion people. It's going to be terrible for anybody left behind. And uh, we're told the 200 million man army, and the reason some people think it's China was because once upon a time, back in the 70s, Mao Zedong said he could support, China could support a 200 million man army, but they never did. As a matter of fact, the Chinese army now may be about 3 million. And there's no history of anyone ever having a 200 million man army. The logistics of putting together that size of an army, deploying it, feeding it, arming it, uh, would be almost impossible. We're also given definitions of what they look like. And when you read the definitions, you find out that there's no Chinaman that looks like any of these guys, what they talk about. Uh, heads of lions, tails of, I don't have it in front of me, but you'll realize many of us believe these are demonic invasion and they're, they're going to kill... Uh, a third of mankind. And then um, you also explained about the war uh, between Michael, the archangel, versus Satan. Yeah, the mid part of the tribulation, Revelation chapter 12, uh, there's a war in heaven between Michael and the archangel and Satan and all the bad angels. Uh, Michael wins it, and Satan and the bad angels, probably about a third of the angels we would suggest, are cast down to the earth. 
and they can never return back to heaven. They're cast on the earth. Satan is very upset because we're told, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Satan realizes his time is short. Satan will realize that on the timeline there's only three and a half years left until the second coming. He's not going to want to believe that, he's, but he's, he's going to realize that that's what the Bible says. He understands prophecy. He thinks his time is short. He's very mad. He's probably going to hook up with all those other demons that are probably still lurking around, the locust demons and the 200 million man army. There's no, we're not told they de depart after they've done their, their dirty deeds. So it's going to be a terrible time on the earth. Satan's going to be cast down on the earth. And the inhabitants of the earth, at that time, they're going to be, you know, the Antichrist will be on the scene with his mark of the beast. And the world will be, many of the inhabitants of the world will be following him, taking the mark of the beast. But that happens all around the same time at the mid part of the tribulation. Right. And then, um, at, of course, and at the end of the tribulation, that's when Jesus comes back and he comes to the Mount of Olives and there's an earthquake. And just for those of you who are watching who are not familiar with scripture, you know, actually, Bill, I don't know if you know, but I became a believer by reading Bible prophecy. I'm not an expert, though, like you. I, I love the details of all the research that you've done, but that's how I became a believer. And so it's like when I saw that the Bible predicted prophecies that were written thousands of years ago, and then it's like reading today's newspaper, that totally shocked me. And so, so after uh, Jesus returns, then what happens again? What does the Bible say? Well, Daniel 12 tells us that there'll be a 75-day interval period whereby God, Jesus will uh, do a lot of things six or seven things, the resurrection of the Old Testament saints, etc. He will restore the earth because the tribulation judgments will devastate it. He will restore it to a Garden of Eden-like condition so it's inhabitable, it's habitable again. Um, and he will, will be a marriage supper of the Lamb will go on. There'll be the mourning period we talked about for, I believe, for 30 days. There'll be a judgment between the sheep and the goat Gentile judgments in Matthew 25. The sheep will gather to the right side, which is a position of honor. And he will say, blessed are you. You help, help the brethren out when they were uh, hungry, thirsty, homeless, naked, sick, in prison, which will be the downward spiral of events that will happen in the mid part of the tribulation because these people won't be able to buy or sell because they won't take the mark of the beast. So they'll become hungry. They'll become thirsty. They'll have to leave their home to get food and water. They'll become homeless. And when they leave their home, they'll take very few garments with them. They'll grow old. They'll become naked. When they become naked, they become sick. When they become sick, they become easily caught and in prison. And he says to these sheep, he says, you help these people, my brethren, in the time of need, you did these acts of kindness. What well, blessed are you now come into the Messianic kingdom prepared for you. And so they're going to go into the kingdom, the sheep Gentiles. That'll include Jews and Gentiles. There'll be remnants from Iran. There'll be remnants from Israel, remnants from Jordan, remnants from Egypt and Assyria that make it through there that will get saved during the tribulation, that will be restored to their homelands. Uh, then he gets to go jet Gentiles and put them on his left side. And I believe this all happens around the end of the 75-day interval. And these go Gentiles primarily have the mark of the beast. And they did none of the acts of kindness. They persecuted the people that needed help. And they will be cast into hell for a thousand years. Then they'll be resurrected at the end of the millennium. And they'll be cast into the lake of fire at, at the White Throne Judgment. So uh, um, please give the, um, your website because there's so many things that you have researched and so much details that, first of all, people have to read your new book and your other books, too. And um, so if you can give your website and even uh, name some of your books, too. Absolutely. Uh, the website is prophecydepot.com, prophecydepot, like homedepot.com. And I've got a lot of books. The Psalm 83 book, I have a nuclear showdown in Iran book, Revealing the Prophecy of Elam, which we talked about. I have a whole Here to Eternity series, which the Now Prophecies, which book one, that could happen, prophecies that could happen at the present time. They lack preconditions like the ones we've been talking about in the program today. The next prophecies have a few preconditions, but they're stage setting. I would include Ezekiel 38 there that I think is about to happen, but has a couple conditions we talked about. And the last prophecies covers the first three and a half years of the tribulation. The final prophecies cover the second three and a half years of the tribulation. And the millennium prophecies and the New Jerusalem covers what happens in the millennium and the eternal order. Uh, those are on DVDs and books. We also have them on a thumb drive 
uh, that people can have. We call it the spiritual survival kit for those left behind. We're concerned that they're going to need to know what's coming. People we love who are not going to be who are not saved or could be left behind, and that could happen very soon. They will need to know what's coming, so we put that on a thumb drive for them. Okay. Any final word? Yes, you had mentioned, Janie, that you got interested in God and saved through Bible prophecy, as did I. I was attending a Bible study taught by Chuck Messer. I didn't want anything to do with God, but I happened to own a mortgage company right next door to it was a Calvary Chapel in Big Bear Lake, shared adjoining walls with me, and I became friends with the pastor. And he said I should come listen to this guy named Chuck Messer, who lived in Big Bear Lake at the time. And he was teaching on the book of Revelation, the seven letters to the seven churches he started with. So I thought, well, I'll check it out. I mean, I started to realize these Christians aren't as scary as I thought, because I was a little concerned about it. I thought they were weird. I, you know, <laughs> I'm sure many people watching this probably felt, felt the same way or feel the same way. But listen, we're not weird. And so I I, uh, I went over and I started attending those studies. And I realized, like you said, that God knew the end from the beginning. That's the real God. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10 says, I am God, there is no other declaring the end from the beginning, things that have not yet come, and I will do all my pleasure, and my counsel will stand. And that's the true statement of God, it authenticates his sovereignty, and I was convinced. And I started studying those past historical fulfillments of prophecies, and every detail that was given was fulfilled 100%. And I realized this is the God, the true God of the Bible, the one I will then commit to. And the reason I say that is because you're going to see prophecies now start to find fulfillment in the Middle East, probably any day. It's already stage setting. And you need to use those to evangelize to the lost because if eschatology, the study of last days, Bible prophecy is a witnessing tool. You can tell people, did you know the Bible talked about Syria, about Russia, about Iran? And you can engage in conversations and pique people's interests and get them to understand that there's more than a secular worldview with fake news and uh, censored social media. There's a biblical narrative and a prophetic perspective that is available to everyone to have, and God wants them to have it because he gave us information to inform us because he loves us and he wants to equip us for the days which we live. Thank you so very much. And I just wanted to a, fa a fast prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you for all those who are watching that their eyes would be open. If they don't know you, that they would ask you, Jesus, into their heart, that they would confess their sins to you and that they would really know you and become believers. And Father, for those who are watching that do know you, but may, may not even understood Bible prophecy, that you would even open up their eyes more to how all of this has been written thousands of years ago. And Father, I just thank you, Lord, for blessing each person who's watching in Jesus' name. Bill, thank you so very much. Oh, Jenny, thank you. It's great to be on your program. It's great to see you again after the years went by since we saw each other at Sid Roth. And so I know it's been 10 years. So yeah, thank you so very much. I'm excited to see what change lives from watching this. Absolutely. Thank you, Janie. Okay, thank you.